Hey guys, welcome to the first video for Cardiology CK. We're going to be doing the entire first aid CK related notes and more. Um, and we're also going to be doing some practice questions here. Again, if you're looking to take a step to CK in 2022 or anytime really, then uh, feel free to reach out to me. I can give you full access to my entire course and access to all my notes. Just shoot me an email. It should be at the bottom of the description, USMLE. Uh, dot live 2018 at gmail.com so reach out to me anytime and we can get you set up uh, i've been teaching on youtube and on various other platforms for the past two years uh, i myself am an md here in new york and you know it's 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 just something i really enjoy i've been very passionate about teaching ever since college days so here we are um what we're going to be starting with we're going to basically go down in the same uh pattern as First ACK does, and we're going to go through everything from top to bottom, where the first topic is cardiovascular. Now, if you're preparing for step one, pretty much everything in first ACK uh, and in step two CK in general is relevant for step one. If anything, step one actually has more topics, right, with a lot more uh, material in biochemistry, uh, some of the nitty gritty things in immunology, stuff like that. But for the most part, Everything in CK is actually valuable knowledge for step one students. So there's no there's no loss in watching uh, CK lectures as well. Um, one of the first topics here actually in cardiovascular CK is a topic that isn't so prominent in step one. As in, it's uh, it's not it's just not taught that well in step one. Uh, most step one resources won't go too deep into the the world of ECGs, and a lot of the step one students I've ever worked with have actually been very behind on truly being able to explain what's happening in the ECG, why it's happening the way it is, and how to actually evaluate ECG. So we're going to be going through the anatomy of an ECG, how it all works, how you're supposed to read ECGs, strips, and then we're going to look at a bunch of practice ones and truly understand the different conditions and how they uh, show up on an ECG strip. Um, so right here, you know, first topic, the normal ECG. So on the right side, I have notes and I'll be writing on it and stuff like that. I can draw things here. I can attach images here to help better explain things. On the left side, I have the actual notes where I'm going to talk about stuff and, you know, just explain what's actually happening with everything we're kind of looking at right now. So as we go into this, you know, the normal rate of any patient is going to be 60 to 100. That's the normal heart rate. If you're going to calculate the normal heart rate, then you can do that by dividing uh, 300 by the number of large squares between QRS complexes. So 300 divided by the number of large squares on the QRS complex. So if you look at this image over here, the large squares are the ones with the solid lines. Okay, Each large square has five little squares in them. All right, And then you can see over here, they're telling you that each of the little squares is 0 0.04 seconds. Okay. And one large square is 0.2 seconds, which means that if you go through five large squares, then you have one second, because right? five times 0.2 is one. So that's the red line I drew over here to uh, annotate one second for you. So basically, the strip that's actually being shown here is dictating what's happening in one second in this patient. Now, I said do 300 divided by the number of large squares, so large squares between QRS complexes. So there's one, two, and basically three large squares here, right? Three large squares, and a little more than that, maybe three and a half large squares. But if you did 300 divided by three large squares, you would get 100. So that's pretty much normal heart rate. This is more than three, right? This is more than three. So if anything, you're dividing by a bigger number, so your heart rate is going to come out something between uh, 90 and 100, maybe. So that's a normal heart rate on this ECG. And then you're seeing the other different uh, parts of an ECG strip which uh, are taught in step one as well, right? So you have your PR interval, you have your QRS complex here, you have the QT interval, which is very significant when it comes to things like torsades. You have your ST segment, which is very significant for things like um, uh, myocardial infarctions. Uh, and then you can just see the TP segment and the RR interval. The RR interval is really something you use, like we just used right now to kind of calculate the heart rate of a patient. Um, now, that being said, the TP segment, this is really just here as a segment that shows you. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as the RP segment. This is the segment that kind of tells you how long it's taking for the heart to repolarize and get ready for the next uh, depolarization. So that's really all that is, far less commonly discussed topic. And then on this image right here, I also have the general timings of how long each of these things should be. 
So it should be about three to four large squares between each KRS complex, just like in this picture. Bradycardia is a slow heart rate. That's usually going to be someone with less than 60 uh, beats per minute heart rate. Uh, and that would encompass more than four squares, right? So if you divide 300 by something bigger than four, now you're going to start getting numbers that are going to end up becoming smaller and smaller. And if it's going to be, give you a heart rate of less than 60, that's bradycardia. Tachycardia is a heart rate over 100. Uh, in general, tachycardia is more significant than bradycardia. All right, tachycardia is a high heart rate of over 100, so that means there's going to be less than three squares. So you're going to be dividing by a number like, imagine dividing 300 by two, that's a heart rate of 150, right? Um, in general, you can understand that if a patient has bradycardia, then with bradycardia, what happens is your heart is beating slowly, but it's getting enough time to fill with blood and then it beats, right? So the blood is being sent out. But sometimes heart rate can become so low that the patient can become hypotensive and uh, undergo syncope because they just weren't able to get enough blood out in time, especially if they're trying to do something like run, go up the stairs and stuff like that. Right? The heart rate needs to go up when you're doing things that would require a higher heart rate anyway. Tachycardia is scarier though. Tachycardia is a very fast heart rate that could be due to a variety of things that can actually sometimes lead to death, like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, right? Something is causing your heart to beat really, really quickly. And when a heart is beating very quickly, it doesn't get enough time to actually fill, right? The ventricle has to expand, then uh, contract. If it's expanding and contracting too quickly, it'll never have enough time to fill. And if the ventricle and atria are not um, contracting and expanding in the way they're supposed to by taking turns, then the atria will never have time to actually squeeze blood into the ventricle and then keep filling you know, simultaneously. So that's gonna be a big issue and you will not get enough blood out at any time, even if the person is resting. Right? And that's where you often see patients who can die overnight because they had a atrial fibrillation episode overnight. Uh, here is just a general anatomy of where the SA and AV nodes are located. Right? So if we, uh, let me just find something real quick. I have my notes open on this other screen as well. Okay, so we're good here. And so you can see your SA node is kind of located right here by the uh, upper part of the superior vena cava, right? And the AV node is kind of in the interatrial septum area, right, between the two atria. And those are your two nodes. This often gets tested, especially in step one. They'll kind of make you pick, instead of saying SA node, they'll or you, they might give you a question on the SA node, but instead of saying SA node, they might actually want you to pick the anatomical location of where the SA node is located. Over here, you have your general understanding of how many, you know, how, how many, uh, how much time is passing in each of these boxes. So as we said, you know, each of the little squares is going to be your 0 0.04 seconds, okay? And then uh, once you have five big squares together, sorry, five little squares together, you get one big square. The one big square, which is five millimeters in uh, length, is 0.2 seconds, okay? And then if you get five big squares, like over here, you get one whole second, okay? So one little square is 0 0.04 seconds, five little squares gives you 0.2 seconds, and then five big squares gives you one second. This is something that you can obviously utilize to kind of see, you know, heart rate, get an estimate in your mind without really having to calculate too much. Um, and then, again, the labeling of the various segments that you are uh, expected to know, right? Um, first topic they discuss in First ACK and in, uh, in the book itself is the topic of axis deviation, right? And they have their mnemonic Rad Ralph and Lad Villa to talk about the different things that can happen that can cause an axis deviation on the ECG. Now, axis deviation, almost no step one student tends to know. And that's what we have these images for over here on the right side. So let's take a look at what's happening with axis deviation. The ECG strip that's on the screen right now is basically a normal ECG screen, uh, strip that you're going to be utilizing to learn um, what you're expected to see in a patient that has no real issues. So we'll, we'll break this down real soon and we'll, we'll go into it. But axis deviation, you, you kind of have to look at different leads to figure out what's happening. Now, how do you start looking at leads? So let's get this down, right? Let's really understand what is the idea of actually understanding what's happening in various leads. So first thing I want to really do is kind of put this lead here uh, and be able to label it for you guys so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to put it right up here. 
over everything and just, just focus on what I'm going to uh, edit, right? So first things first, when you look at this lead, you can see that every lead, lead one, lead two, lead three, lead ABF, ABL, V2, V3, V6, V5, V4, out of every lead, only all of those leads are pointing up except AVR. AVR is pointing down. Right? You can see the QRS complex is pointing down in AVR. And V1, V1 is also pointing down. The QRS complex in V1 is pointing down. And so I wrote here, note that in normal ECG, all the leads point up except V1 and AVR, which are the two right-sided leads. They point down. Okay, Both leads are on the right side of the patient, AVR on the right arm, and V1 on the right of the mediastinum. Right, so if you haven't seen where the leads get placed in the patient, um, you can see that right here in the picture I've added. So uh, this image is showing you the V leads, right? So V1 through V6, this is where you put it on your patient when you lay them down. V1, you can see, goes on the right side of the mediastinum. Keep in mind that your heart is kind of situated in this manner, right? So it's directed towards this way. So because of that, it helps to pull more leads in this direction. If you have a patient who's got dextrocardia and their heart is pointing the other way, you can actually perform a right-sided ECG once you find out that they have a right-sided heart. Now, the way the leads work, uh, so you're, you're going to have your other guys, the AVR, AVL. So you can see AVR goes on the right arm. Right? So that's going to be over here. Right? So it's also on the right side. AVF goes on the left leg. AVL goes on the left arm. So everything else, everything else is on the left side. And they will not be causing the same kind of electrical uh, input. So basically, you have to kind of imagine which way the electrical impulses are going. So if I redraw the heart in here, the way I was showing it to you, it's a peanut-looking heart. But the point of this is that first thing that happens is from the SA node, you're going to get electricity going in this direction towards the AV node, right? And then the AV node is going to send electricity all the way up to here right, to cause depolarization of your ventricles and then and then your Purkinje fibers are going to bring some the the electricity into the ventricles and that's going to be a full depolarization so you can see this whole time electricity is moving in that direction when electricity is moving towards these electrodes that are on the patient the lead goes up when electricity is moving away from any of these uh uh, electric uh, nodes that are on the patient, the lead actually goes down. So this is why AVR and V1 are going down. Now, when you're looking at uh, axis deviation, the, the leads that you have to analyze for axis deviation are actually 1, 2, and AVF. In normal patients, as we just discussed, 1, 2, and AVF would be pointing up. Right? The only things that should be pointing down are AVR and V1 because both of them are on the right side. AVR, V1, right? So we get that. Now, this is a normal patient. I imagine if someone has a left axis deviation. So let's take a look at this. This here is showing you what we mean by axis, right? So on, on any ECG, you have these circles here showing you a uh, full degree, right? Full degree going from 0 to 90 degrees, then to 180 degrees. And then, of course, it goes around to make 360 degrees. But over here on the top part, the top part is negative numbers. So 180 to negative 90, negative 90 back to 0. Right, a circle is 360 degrees, so you have your full 360 degrees in here, but for our cardiac purposes, the top half of the circle is negative numbers, okay? Now, in normal axis, you can see that this arrow is pointing in the direction that the heart and the electricity coming in the heart will be pointing, which is in this direction, right? So we're good on that. We get it. And this is the red arrow. This is a normal patient. Now, imagine someone with left axis deviation. So we have this mnemonic LAD villa. The villa stands for a couple of things. V is for ventricular tachycardia. That can cause left axis deviation. The uh, I is for an inferior MI, which usually involves the right coronary artery or the posterior descending artery uh, infarction. Right? So if you have an MI, of course, you're not really going to be doing a good job with the uh, uh, the right coronary artery, most, most of these patients, most commonly. And that messes up function of the AV node, so electricity doesn't tend to go in the correct direction that well. Uh, the L's, both of the L's stand for different things. The first L I've written as a number one, okay? And this L over here I've written as an arrow pointing up. But those are supposed to be L's, okay? So I'm going to tell you why they are a one and an arrow pointing up first. Sorry, later. But first I'm going to tell you what the L's actually stand for. So the first L stands for left ventricular hypertrophy. And anyone where the left ventricle is just becoming much thicker and stronger, maybe because they have hypertension. The other L and the A with it stand for left anterior hemi block. 
Okay, so that's a far less common topic, but it could be related to, uh, for, for whatever reason, the electrical parts of the heart just not working very well. So there's a block of actual conduction of electricity. Now, why did I write them as an arrow uh, and, and a number one? So Lad Villa fully helps you understand, as the one and the arrow pointing up, that V1 will be pointing up, okay? In left axis deviation, lead one. Okay, so remember we're, what we're looking at for uh, axis deviation is always one, two, and AVF. All right, so sorry, I think I said V1, not V1, lead one. Right, we're always looking at one, two, and AVF. So lead one, lead one will be pointing up. The other two, lead two and lead AVF, will actually be pointing down. So what this mnemonic is supposed to help you understand is only lead one will be pointing up. So you can see here, they're showing you lead one is pointing up, lead two is pointing down, the QRS is pointing down, and AVF is also pointing down, which is incorrect, right? Because you can see here, AVF is pointing up, lead two is pointing up, everyone is pointing up besides AVR and V1. So in left axis deviation patients, only lead one will be up. And by only, I mean from these three. From these three, one, two, and AVF, only one will be up. Two and AVF will be pointing down. So these patients end up looking like this on the ECG. Okay, that's your left axis deviation. So left axis deviation actually causes electrical impulses to really just travel in this direction, hence giving you this arrow going from negative 30 to negative 90 degrees. Right, that's bad. That's not good. And this is happening because something is causing stronger impulses towards the left ventricle or weaker impulses from the right. Okay, so that's what the... Uh, right ventricular hypertrophy is kind of causing, all right? So remember, um, sorry, not uh, right, what am I saying? The uh, the left anterior hemiblock is causing, okay? So remember, we had a group of things here. We had ventricular tachycardia, inferior MI, where the right ventricle is not working, so you get weaker impulses from the right ventricle, causing more of the left ventricle to win out, and the arrow points that way. The others are all where the left ventricle is stronger, left ventricular hypertrophy, left anterior hemiblock is a mixed topic, uh, kind of more difficult to explain, but it's a very uncommon topic anyway. If you see a question on it, you'll definitely understand a lot better. Uh, eventually, we'll actually look at some practice questions as well as we go through this. But the main thing here is to really understand what's happening with these axis deviations, right? Why is this significant and how do you catch it? So LAD Villa, you get the mnemonic of Villa, you get all the things it stands for. And then the new things I've added into it, the one and the arrow pointing up to tell you that lead one is the only one pointing up, lead two and AVF are pointing down. Now let's look at the other thing. So you have your right axis deviation. Right, right axis deviation is actually a mnemonic rad Ralph. I didn't write Ralph because it doesn't change into anything for me, but it's actually rad Ralph the whole thing. Not, not the most uh, significant part for this mnemonic. The Ralph is great for memorizing all the things that can cause right axis deviation, but axis deviation etiologies are pretty commonsensical. So why would more of your electricity be going towards the right heart? Right, why would it dive in this direction? Well, for one thing, right ventricular hypertrophy, for whatever reason, your right ventricle has become much stronger. Maybe the patient is having Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, anterolateral MI, so your left ventricle just became weaker, so the right is winning. Anterolateral MI usually occur because of uh, the LAD infarct or lateral circumflex infarct. It could also be left posterior hemiblock, so that's what the LPA stands for, and that's it. All right, so Ralph is a very simple mnemonic. Left posterior hemiblock is an extremely rare topic. But the right ventricular hypertrophy, especially with a patient with maybe pulmonary hypertension, and anterolateral MI are the more common things that you can see here. Both of those can cause right axis deviation, and you can see the electricity moving more towards the right ventricle. So then what happens there? Well, in this, the D, I turned the D in RAD to down. Okay, We're still only really concerned with v, uh, with lead 1 when we're, con when we're using these mnemonics. So in right axis deviation, lead one is the one that's pointing down. And the other two are normally pointing up. So lead two is still pointing up like it's supposed to. AVF is still pointing up like it's supposed to. Okay. So the real thing that we're memorizing is what happens to lead one. And then the other two do the opposite in these pathological situations. Lad villa, lead one is pointing up. The other two point down. Pathological. Left axis deviation. Rad... Ralph, the rad down is to remind you that lead one is pointing down, lead two and AVF are doing the opposite and pointing up, pathological. They're all supposed to be pointing up like you see up here. Okay, so that's your general idea of how you're supposed to work with uh, axis deviation. That's really all there is to 
that uh, part of this, this conversation, really. Um, actually, I'll keep the Ralph written here. Right, so that's part of the mnemonics. We might as well keep that. Um, we got the normal electricity flow. So let me actually put this uh, ECG back in here again <clears throat> to show you more about how you're supposed to read an ECG. So right now we looked at understanding axis deviation, right? So if a patient comes in with certain symptoms that may make me think they have either an anterolateral MI, one of the most common topics uh, regarding ECGs and cardiology, or maybe we think they have an inferior MI, the other most common topic regarding uh, MI being the most common topic, uh, or we think they have left ventricular hypertrophy, whatever it might be, we can quickly analyze it by seeing if there's an axis deviation. So now when you start doing questions and when you see a question that came up of a patient with an inferior MI because their right coronary artery infarcted and they gave you an ECG, you'll probably see the villa aspect of things, right? So the I over here in lat villa is for an inferior MI. And we said that inferior MI is going to have a uh, left axis deviation and, no, and we know that only lead one will be up, right? So lead one will be pointing up. Lead two and AVF may be either not pointing up as high as they're supposed to or actually pointing down. Remember, things are not always solid, right? It's not like a yes or no. In ECGs and in most things in medicine, a lot of the symptoms and things you're going to see depend on how severe is the problem, how bad has it gotten, how long has it been, right? So if a patient has had an MI and things are pretty bad, then yes, lead two and AVF would definitely be pointing down because it's progressed, right? Whereas if they just had the MI, then maybe not enough changes have occurred yet, so you may not see the changes in axis deviation. Axis deviation doesn't just happen instantly. But you are going to start now noticing that. If you ever get a patient with any of these symptoms that fit the rad Ralph and Ladville uh, list of um, uh, conditions that cause axis deviation, you're going to start seeing the axis deviations now on your ECG. That helps you further confirm what you're looking for, right? Now, if you have a patient with an inferior MI, you know that you're looking for right coronary artery infarct or a PDA infarct, and you should know that for that, for the inferior MI, from step one we learned, the most significant group to look at is leads two, three, and AVF. So already you're looking at leads two, three, and AVF, which means you're already looking at leads two and AVF, which kind of overlap with what you would look at for axis deviation. Right? For axis deviation, you need to look at lead one, two, and AVF. So when you, whenever you do any of these questions where you're looking at two and AVF because of an inferior MI, pay close attention to one also. Lead one, two, and AVF, and three, all of these. Every lead should be pointing up besides AVR and, v, and V1. So if you don't see that, then something is wrong, okay? Um, here also, what would you see for an inferior MI? Well, inferior MI is depending on if it's a STEMI or NSTEMI, can have ST elevation, right? Or it can have ST depression. So what you would see is that this line here would get altered, right? So then here, this is looking like, you know, what it's supposed to is a normal person. But in ST elevation, it can be up here. It can be like that. And then you get your T wave. Then it comes back down, does this, goes like that. Right? And then it, it keeps going. But the, the bottom part here is the problem. Right? So you're going to see like that. Let me do this correctly and like that again, right? So you're going to see this ST elevation. It's not going to fit the same baseline as this first line I drew. ST elevation is going to be everywhere, of course, in the whole two, in the whole three, possibly even the whole EVF, stuff like that. ST elevation would be a giveaway for that uh, MI, inferior MI for that patient in these leads. And then you would be further able to analyze what you're supposed to do based off of the symptoms. And of course, always read the question, you know, do they want you to diagnose it? Do they want you to confirm something? Do they want you to treat a specific thing? Right? You have to make sure you answer the question that's in, in, the, in the test, not the question you came up with in your own mind. Another thing you want to make sure you start doing is anytime you do get an ECG strip, you should kind of cut it down in half in your mind. On the right side, there's only one thing to look at. Remember how we showed you that uh, right here on the picture behind the ECG that we were looking at, the lead V1 was on the right side of the mediastinum and then the others were all going in this direction. So because of the way these leads V1 through V6, because of the way they're placed, there's something called an R-wave progression, okay? So R-wave progression is a pretty, pretty common topic, very high yield. You want to make sure you always catch that. Let me show you what that's supposed to look like. So if I paste this picture I just picked up, right here you can see V1 through V6. And what are you seeing here? Well, if I draw it in, you'll catch it even better. 
V1 is supposed to point down. And then look at what happens as you go. You develop somewhat of a sine curve, right? So you got this curve here, and it looks like there is a downwards curve and then an upwards curve, and basically it gives you a circle if you overlap it. So you could see that in this normal ECG as well, right? It's a weak little impulse downwards. V2 is pretty isoelectric. V3 is now pointing up. V4 has reached maximal upward direction. V5 is then simmering down again. And then V6 is back to being normal height, right? This is your R wave progression. This is showing you that the impulse is traveling really nicely and the R wave is showing you the correct uh, amount of actual uh, impulse conduction that's supposed to happen. V4 gets, you know, and it can be any one of them, V3, V4, V5, based on different patients. But generally speaking, V4 is going to be the one that has the highest peak. And remember what the peaks mean. It's voltage. I remember every graph has an X and Y axis. Down here is time. Up here is voltage. So the highest peak here is usually going to be in V4 because voltage is highest by that point. Okay, that's where the strongest amount of electricity reaches the heart and you get your full depolarization happening, all right? So that's something you want to be doing. You always want to be looking for the R wave progression in these guys. If, if in any of these, the R wave is not working, then that lead is looking towards the side of the heart that is not working well, okay? So make sure you understand that. Um, other than that, these other leads are dependent on the other arteries and other parts of the heart, and we're going to see that soon enough as well. But that takes care of axis deviation, right? Uh, we got down this solid bolded part over here as well. We understand that each small square is 0 0.04 seconds. Five small squares equal one solid square, and one solid square equals 0.2 seconds. Five solid squares gives you one second. Okay. Usually, depending on you know how long of a strip you're given, usually you'll probably only really see this much of an ECG. All right. So you may be lucky enough to see five solid squares giving you what has happened in one second. And then you can start using that to kind of guesstimate uh, what the patient's heart rate is. <clears throat> QRS interval is supposed to be 0.1 seconds, which is half of a solid square. So you can see that here. Right, QRS interval is pretty much less, a little less than, but pretty much half of a solid square. And so this is your full solid square, and the QRS only fits half of it. And so about this much of it is your... QRS, okay? Um, QT interval is one large square, about 0.4 seconds, all right? So one large square, you can see, is correct for the QT interval from here to here, a little more than a large square, all right? Uh, QT interval is something that's going to be messed up in Jarvell and Lange Nielsen syndrome or even rheumatoid ward syndrome. Remember, there's a mnemonic for these guys, Jarvell and Lange Nielsen. Lange -Nielsen has the word and in it. So these people usually have QT prolongation as well as deafness, right? Congenital deafness. Um, but this doesn't have the letter D in the name of the disease. So it's actually autosomal recessive. romano ward syndrome is also a dominant version of the same QT prolongation disease, but it does not have um, deafness in it. Okay, so the and helps me remember that there's two issues wrong with Jovell and Lange Nielsen. And the D in romano ward reminds me that romano ward is the autosomal dominant version. But you can get QT prolongation in other reasons too, like medications. There's a whole list of medications um, that can cause prolongation of your QT interval, right? Class 1A, like dasuparamide, cranium, procainamide. Remember your double quarter pounder mnemonic that I discussed in the step one videos a long time ago. So double quarter pounder is a type of a burger in America and in many other, uh, basically a, a type of burger in McDonald's, so many other countries as well. And uh, that double quarter pounder mnemonic is to remind you of the medications that are in class 1A. I also similarly had eat more fries, please, and other different kinds of mnemonics for the other class medications as well. Um, so class 1A medications can actually prolong QT interval. Uh, class 3, ibutilide, fetalide, sodalol. Right? But in this group, remember for here, the mnemonic for class 3 was AIDS. AIDS, A-I-D-S was the... Uh, list of medications that fit the class three. And the class three medications, amiodarone is one of the most important ones to remember there. Here you can see ibutilide, dofetilide, and sodalol. All three of them can actually cause QT prolongation, but amiodarone does not. Amiodarone causes a bunch of other bad side effects with thyroid problems and skin discoloration and whatnot, but it does not cause 
QT prolongation. So very important topic. There's actually a whole question on that in uh, a couple of Q banks. Macrolides like urethromycin, typical and atypical antipsychotics, TCAs like amitriptyline, imipramine, doxepine, and a couple others, as well as the anti-emetic on Encetron. All of these can cause QT prolongation. And if you have QT prolongation, then imagine it's already pretty long to begin with. If this gets any longer, you're also going to end up lengthening this. And if you lengthen the RR intervals, then you're going to make more boxes appear between RR intervals, which means that you're going to have bradycardia. You're going to have a patient with a slower heart rate and they get QT prolongation. And induced QT prolongation from medications doesn't appear throughout the entire ECG. So you're going to have like a little bit of QT prolongation here, but then not having it in other places. So it's going to be a weird, irregular heart rate. Sometimes it's going to slow down, then it'll get normal, then it'll get slowed down, then it'll get normal. So the induced version is usually the more problematic one, and that's usually what kind, what the, the majority of your QT prolongation patients are going to show up with, right? Because they're taking some kind of medication, they're now having QT prolongation, and basically all you really have to do is, one, of course, stop the offending agent, get rid of the medication that's causing it, and then you can treat it. And the treatment of this is pretty straightforward. So when you, let me just uh, find something real quick because... <clears throat> I think there was one other medication I'll keep getting. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, so in antipsychotics, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. Pretty much all of them cause it, but the most significant one is really halo, haloperidol. That's the one you want to look at. But yeah, treatment is pretty straightforward. There's two things you have to do. One, definitely stop the medication or whatever the offending agent is. And then two, you need to give your patient magnesium sulfate right so magnesium is actually magnesium sulfate is actually what's also used in patients with eclampsia like preeclampsia patients you give the magnesium sulfate also magnesium is basically going to help them with the uh, uh the atp channels that are on that area right so on the heart basically to help do this correctly and keep in mind the little very accurate inf uh, topic that did get tested on step one point down on ck is the potassium aspect, right? So the real issue that uh, directly causes torsades or QG prolongation is potassium deficiency, right? There's also gonna be magnesium and possibly calcium deficiency, but the potassium deficiency is what really ends up causing the torsades type of thing to occur. Remember from uh, step one cardiovascular that potassium was the one responsible for your um, repolarization, right? So repolarization was all potassium. Very important to keep that in mind. Uh, all right, so moving on, next thing, the big topic of myocardial infarction that we slightly touched on, right? Slightly touched on. So right here, this is actually going to start going into your other topics. So we're going to stay on this page for now because we're still looking at the same kind of thing. Myocardial infarction in the ECG. Now, on step one, one of the biggest things about myocardial infarction was understanding the progression of an MI, right? Progression of an MI was uh, heavily tested, where they would tell you a patient had an MI maybe two days ago, maybe a week ago, maybe a month ago, and then now today they're presenting with some new symptoms, and you had to figure out how long ago their uh, MI had occurred or what the new symptom is due to, right? If they told you the symptoms, you would figure out, oh, if this is the thing they got, this is the incident that occurred, then their MI must have occurred X, Y, or Z long ago. So to get that down, you really need to understand what happens in the progression of an MI. Keep in mind that in the first four hours, absolutely nothing happens, right? Um, a patient just had an MI, they're still there. Whether they're alive or dead is two different topics, but let's assume they're alive right now, right? So we can actually have progression. Um, if they're still alive, in the first four hours, you're not going to see anything. Histologically speaking, if you look, everything's going to still kind of look pretty normal. And you're not really going to be able to identify any massive changes. But then the 4 to 12 hour period is where you start getting early coagulation necrosis. Remember from step one pathology, coagulation necrosis is the kind of thing that mainly occurs in the heart. You're also going to see some edema. You're going to see some hemorrhage. And one of the most notable fibers are going to be your wavy fibers, right? So in step one, you learn about these wavy fibers that are going to start appearing. Neutrophils start coming in and 
there's going to be a chance of repercussion injury here. But the most significant thing that has occurred right now in the area that got an MI is that the sodium potassium ATPases are no longer working, right? So you get this hypoxic environment as the sodium potassium ATPase stops functioning and the myocardial cells are now going to start accumulating things in the wrong places. So remember what the uh, sodium potassium pump did? It's pumpkin, the mnemonic pumpkin. Pumpkin reminds you of pump K in, right? So it's supposed to actually bring potassium into the cell and put sodium out of the cell. Now, pumpkin is going to help you because now you're not doing that. So when your potassium ATP is not working, so you're going to accumulate a lot of extracellular potassium. You're going to accumulate a lot of intracellular sodium and calcium. The sodium and calcium that are inside the cell are actually going to pull water into the cardiac cells, causing edema. And now with all the potassium outside, remember what potassium was supposed to do. Potassium was mainly for repolarization. So with all this potassium outside, there's a high chance of patient getting a ventricular arrhythmia, which is usually fatal, right? So most patients that have an MI and they don't get help in time die because of ventricular arrhythmia. Other reasons they can die is a cardiogenic shock. Of course, if they're bleeding out too much or they became very hypertensive and couldn't make it in time to get some help, that's a purpose. And then heart failure, of course, the heart is dying, so failure. Um, but the, these are the things you're watching out for, right? So you need to understand it's pretty commonsensical, right? In the first day, the moment they had their heart attack, the sodium potassium ATPA stopped working. So all the potassium is stuck outside the cell and all that potassium can cause a ventricular arrhythmia. There's a very interesting question where they told you that there was an experiment being done, transient MI is being induced into a patient and that causes myocardial cells to actually increase in size, right? So that's what they're saying. They're, they're doing an experiment they're taking all these human heart cells and they're causing a transient MI and the cells are getting bigger now, aka basically what you're supposed to understand is edema is occurring. They then tell you this effect, the size of this cell increasing is not uh, any kind of hypertrophy or anything like that, it's edema. This effect is due in part because of what? And they had a bunch of massive choices. Is it because of the intracellular potassium, intracellular calcium, high bicarbonate or some kind of cascade protein phosphorylation, uh, net solute loss. They came up with a bunch of different acid choices. And of course, majority of them work. But the one acid that tripped everyone was the acid that said, is this effect due to intracellular potassium, right? And it's not. Remember, we just said it. Potassium is extracellular. It's outside. Potassium got stuck outside. And that's the only correct acid choice from everything I said. Sorry, the, is, that's the only uh, answer choice related to. It's not the correct answer. It's the only answer choice related to everything we said earlier, right? We said earlier that accumulation of potassium outside is the thing that's going to cause um, edema. But everyone remembered potassium, and then they ended up picking the answer choice. The only correct answer choice I said from everything I said, so this is everything I said. It was either uh, high intracellular potassium, high intracellular calcium, high cellular bicarb, protein phosphorylation, or net solute loss. Of all of these five things, only one of them is actually occurring, and that's the high intracellular calcium. But that answer choice was so far-fetched for most people, they didn't pick it, okay? But there is gonna be high intracellular calcium. And of course, with having a lot of potassium outside, intracellular potassium, and intracellular calcium, which remember is significant contractions, you can get a lot of contractions occurring, leading to a ventricular arrhythmia, right? So the only correct answer choice you could pick was that, of course, they didn't give the easier answer choice of high intracellular sodium, which is actually the direct cause of the edema. But again, you had to pick what was best. So you want to make sure you really get these little nitty gritty facts down accurately because it just leads to stupid questions and stupid mistakes. And then you just feel bad when you come back and look at it. But that's the first 24 hours, basically, right? Now you go into days one to three. So the first half of the week where this patient just had an MI, they made it. They made it to day two now, right? So day two, now what can start happening is you still have extensive coagulated necrosis, uh, but now you're also going to see a lot of inflammation occurring, right? Because you're cleaning up. Neutrophils are really trying to clean everything up. And the only thing that matters here is the inflammation. So the inflammation can actually lead to post-infarction fibrinous pericarditis, right? That's the new complication because the inflammation can actually reach to the pericardium, and now you're going to have a patient with pericarditis. And remember, pericarditis on step is usually acute pericarditis, which is most likely going to be due to viral etiologies like Coxsackie virus. 
Um, but it can also be autoimmune because of lupus. It can be due to uremia in the patient with chronic renal failure. And then in our case scenario that we're discussing right now, post-myocardial infarction, right? If you have early pericarditis, it's because of the uh, inflammation that's occurring. Much later on, much further down in the recovery phase of a patient with an MI, you can see uh, acute pericarditis due to uh, Dressler syndrome as well. So that's another thing we're going to get to once we reach that, that phase. But right now, we're in the first few days. So here, we only care about that, post-infarction and fibrinous pericarditis. Now, as they approach week two, what's happening is the inflammation happened, the cleaning up happened. Now, macrophages are going to start coming in. Right? So macrophages come. They try to uh, start forming granulation tissue, basically, at the margins. And things are being repaired. So when you're repairing something that broke, there's a chance it can break again. Right? So you can get free wall rupture. The wall can literally just break, especially if the patient tries doing something like uh, extensively tiring, right? like picking up something heavy, going for a jog. Maybe they heard really bad news and their heart you know, just started pumping really quickly. Um, all of those are things that can suddenly lead to free wall rupture. And if the wall ruptures, blood leaks out into the pericardial sac and you get tamponade. Right? So you're going to be watching out for that topic. And when we get to tamponade, we're going to see that what you start hearing is muffled heart sounds because there's a lot of fluid between the heart and your stent, so you can't really hear the heart sounds well. You can also have papillary muscle ruptures. So depending on which artery uh, caused the MI, you can have papillary muscles that also lose blood supply and they just stop working. Most commonly, you're going to get posterior medial papillary muscle rupture because that only has one supply, and that's usually related to right coronary artery with an inferior MI. So of course, with that... Uh, not working well, you're going to get mitral regurgitation, and you're going to hear that. Right? The, uh, mitral regurgitation basically means that the mitral valve is always open, so blood is going to be moving back and forth in both directions all the time, systole and diastole. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that can occur is a left ventricular pseudoaneurysm. Yeah, pseudoaneurysm, which can also then later rupture. So pseudoaneurysm is not a full aneurysm, it's a fake aneurysm, because only the outer layer is going to kind of just plop out, right? So that's the outer layer of the heart. Um, those false aneurysms, not really the biggest deal, as long as it's caught on time, maybe you'll see it on an echo. But since it's only one layer, it's not the full heart kind of aneurysming, just the outer layer of the heart is aneurysming, it can burst and then that can lead to other big complications and the patient can go back into really bad conditions again. After these first two weeks pass, when you're into you know the first month coming to an end, that scar gets completed. Metalloproteases are going to come and complete the uh, type 3 collagen to type 1 collagen and finish your entire um, scar uh, development. So now you're going to have a wall that you've been kind of just putting up, but then you've cemented it down and now you have a very solid wall, right? So of course, a solid wall isn't just going to rupture. It's not going to break. However, it's also not going to work as well as it used to. Remember, the heart is supposed to be contracting and moving. Now you have this little part that has a solid wall to it. It's not going to contract that well, okay? So it's a solid wall that can then accumulate blood on it. This is what you call a mural thrombus. Mural because a painting is a mural. So you're basically painting on this wall with blood, right? It's a hypocontractile part of the heart that is now working as a canvas for you to paint on. And blood is kind of getting stuck onto it and stasis can occur. And then eventually, at some point, when something happens that causes that part of the, the solid wall to maybe bend and contract or fold, the, the thrombus can come off, and then it can go dislodge and get stuck somewhere. That's a big problem. So you got to be careful with that. This is why there's a whole concussion of medication that patients have to be on after NMI. Another thing that can occur is you can get a true aneurysm. So I said that the wall won't just rupture. But the whole wall could aneurysm. If a different, if, if any part of this new contracted uh, scar is kind of weak, it can just entirely plump out, right? And that's really bad. True aneurysm of the whole three layers, which won't easily rupture, but it's also not easy to fix. And if you have an aneurysm anywhere in the heart, now you have a little pouch that can also start accumulating blood in there. Also a problem, right? So mural thrombuses and True aneurysms are a bit of a problem that can occur in a patient that uh, got an MI two, uh, a month or two ago. And the last issue here is the one that I previously mentioned, Dressler syndrome, uh, where you it's a type 2 hypersensitivity involving you know, antigen antibody, two things, uh, mainly Th cells, helper T cells, where the 
your own white blood cells, your own T cells are not recognizing this brand new wall of your heart as a self cell. So they think it's an outside cell. They think it's some kind of invader and they start attacking it. Right? So it's an autoimmune condition where you're now again going to have inflammation because you're attacking your own heart and you get acute pericarditis, right? So that's the whole list of things that occur in progression of an MI. It should never be too confusing and it's something you want to kind of make commonsensical for yourself because it generally speaking is. Um, looking at how it progresses is pretty commonsensical. Like you're not going to get Dressel syndrome on day one. And we get why on day one, these uh, electrolytes are where they are because the ATPA stopped working. So I hope this kind of better clarified that for you. Now, when it comes to the ECG, a lot of things are going to change, but generally speaking, it depends on whether you're looking at an ST elevation MI or an end STEMI. And we're going to be looking at that later on as well. So we're, we're going to come back to that. But you know, you could have ST elevation MI or uh, ST depression MI, which is a non-ST elevation MI. And uh, those changes are going to be mainly, you know, just visualized right here, the ST segment. Right, so either this ST segment is going to come up like, like this, and then try to do a T set, yeah, uh, the, the T um, uh, point right there like that, or you're going to get ST depression. So you see how this came down, and then it would just stay like that, and then it would come up to do the T, okay? So those are your two different variations, ST elevation, non-ST elevation, aka ST depression. Uh, when we get to uh, the topic of uh, MI in more depth on the ECG, we're going to look at uh, what what each of those is really supposed to mean. Okay. Next thing here in first ACK, they talk about your um, chamber enlargement. Now, chamber enlargement, this is really just something you learn because it might show up, but it's really not something you see on the test that frequently. It's not that commonly asked topic. It's not a very confusing topic. And um, to be entirely honest, I've never personally actually seen a question where it helped me. But it's something you should know. It's just something you know, nothing crazy. Just get it into your mind and understand it. So you can either have right atrial enlargement or you can have your left atrial enlargement. And then, of course, you can have ventricular hypertrophy as well. Right atrial enlargement causes the P wave in lead 2 to be taller. So you can see this is a ECG strip showing you only lead 2. And you can see that the P wave is tall. Right, that's literally all that happens. That's right atrial enlargement. Why lead two? Well, remember where lead two is, right? Lead two is over here, basically looking in this direction, looking at your right atria. So you can see the heart is faintly drawn behind there. So this part here is basically your right atrium. Right? This is all your right ventricle. This is left ventricle. Remember, the majority of the left ventricle is on the back of the heart. And then back here, you have your left atrium, right? So you can see lead two is looking right at the right atrium. And if your right atria is big, it's going to be making bigger atrial contractions. Recall that the P wave is an atrial contraction, right? So you can see that the P wave just gets taller. It's almost the same height as the QRS complex, which it shouldn't be. The P wave is literally only one box high. QRS is almost uh, five to six little boxes high, right? The voltage in the ventricular contraction is much higher than the voltage in a atrial contraction. So lead two P wave is higher. That's a sign of P pulmonale. Patient may have some kind of pulmonary issue like uh, pulmonary hypertension. So their right atria is having to work harder to, to contract. It could also be tricuspid stenosis. So the right atria has to contract harder to open the tricuspid valve. Um, left atrial enlargement causes the lead two to be wider. Okay, so left atrial enlargement now, left atrial enlargement is on that side, right? Left atria is over there. But we still look at lead 2, and something interesting happens in lead 2. This is called P mitrale, right, because the mitral valve is over there. Usually, the um, left atria will only enlarge because it's trying to become stronger to push open a, a stenotic mitral valve, right? So mitral stenosis patients uh, or even hypertension patients, but mainly mitral stenosis patients. So it's called P mitrale, and a very interesting thing happens here. The P wave becomes bifid or M-shaped. So you can see the M-shaped P wave, right? It's got two hills. The P is in a single, is in a single nice hill like that. It's an M, right? So P mitrale, a giveaway for left atrial enlargement, and then you can start looking at acid choices of list of things that may be related to things that can cause mitral, sorry, uh, cause atrial enlargement of any type, right? So you start looking for, for different etiologies. 
For ventricular hypertrophy, if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, so this example images here, if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, the QRS complexes become taller in V1 and V2. Remember, the Vs are all lined along with the ventricles. Right? So you can see the Vs will be here to here. So they look at your ventricles and right? they, they establish a circle of electrical axes on a 3D dimension, looking at your ventricles from all directions. Okay, So now we don't care about leads one or two or anything like that. Now, for ventricular purposes, we care about the V1s through V6, which remember we just talked about are supposed to have an R wave progression, right? Let me see if that was the last thing I pasted. Yeah, perfect. All right, so R wave progression, as you can see right here. All right, so R wave progression V1 and V6. And also recall that only lead V1 and AVR, the two that are on the right side, should be pointing downward. Everything else eventually, or everything else is pointing upwards. So in, in left ventricular hypertrophy, you can see V1 is pointing down, but what do you see? It's not a tiny down. It's supposed to be a tiny down. It's not supposed to be a very long down, but the voltage has increased, right? There's much more voltage now. Remember the length is voltage, right? The height of these, um, the height is, is uh, voltage, the length is time. So the height of these uh, different parts of an ECG tell you how much electricity is going into that, that heart. And if V1, V2 are your super tall guys, even though I said V4 is supposed to be the tallest, clearly you have bad R wave progression. Right? For whatever reason, something is wrong in the ventricles. V4 should be the highest guy, but V1 and V2, and in this specific example, V2 looks like the highest guy. This is a person with left ventricular hypertrophy. All right. It's, their left ventricle is having the strongest impulses because it's got a lot of extra muscle to it. Now, right ventricular hypertrophy is even easier to catch, and that's because there's something weird that's happening here. V1 is now pointing up. So again, of course, your, your R wave progression is messed up because it started wrong, right? R wave progression was supposed to start with the V1 pointing down. V1 is pointing up. In right ventricular hypertrophy, you have V1 pointing up, which is normally down, and the QRS complexes are taller in V2 and V3. Once again, you can see here now, V3 looks like your tallest guy, right? Not V4. And then there's just a really funky progression happening. So for right ventricular hypertrophy, the giveaway is that V1 is pointing up and your R wave progression is messed up. For left ventricular hypertrophy, V1 is just pointing down too strongly, thereby messing up your R wave progression, making V2 the highest R wave progression. You can also see something else here. The V3 has this weird ST issue, right? ST, this didn't come back to the baseline. The baseline was on the line. It didn't come back. Right, so that's kind of showing you possibly even a uh, MI occurring at some at some point, right? Or a patient maybe that's prone to getting an MI, so you want to start treating them before the MI actually occurs. Right? So that's the basic topic of chamber enlargement. Much simpler topic than the topic of your um, axis deviation, which also wasn't that complicated. It just, in my opinion, isn't really taught that well in um, in school. Right, it's just not a very high yield topic in uh, med school for most students. So most med students that go into taking step one never really grasp the topic that well, all right? So you gotta make sure that uh, you, you, you grasp it. And I hope that this explanation did help. In our next video, we'll go into the arrhythmias and we'll start looking at many ECGs and more practice questions to try to have a better understanding of how each of these arrhythmias will present and what to actually catch in them.